roughly for every truck that you convert from diesel operations to zero emissions, this is assuming green hydrogen, you're saving about 130 uh, tons per year. So, and that's just one truck, about 800,000 trucks are made per year. So there's a clear pathway to, to scaling this up and having a very meaningful impact just within trucking. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Clean Tech. He's the podcast. This is episode 35, and this is the second episode for this week. Kind of doing a double feature talking about hydrogen and the fuel cell space. Uh, today's episode, as mentioned last week or earlier this week, is with uh, David Jaramillo, the CTO and, and co founder of Vern. Uh, this is a hydrogen storage solution that essentially is kind of like the gas tank you can think of of a, of a car, right? Uh, it's where you store the hydrogen prior to it being run through the fuel cell. So I think it's a very interesting conversation to follow up on right after last, earlier this week's topic with, uh, with Corey about fuel cells. So I think very interesting topic in general, really appreciated um, what David was able to share with us. They're doing some very interesting things. And of course, uh, I think it's very exciting to see what they'll do this year. They have a, a, a trial being deployed this year and uh, we'll continue to, to grow and see what they do. So uh, without, without further ado, uh, let's all make a quick mention to our sponsors, and then we can get into the show. So, as always, thank you so much, Next Wave Partners, for making this making this podcast possible. Um, Next Wave are experts in the recruitment space and talent acquisition across climate tech, renewables, ESG, and technology globally. So, if your team is growing or you are looking to make a career change, please consider reaching out to Next Wave. You can do that at next wavepartners dot com, or you can reach out to one of their consultants directly through LinkedIn. And um, yes. Thank you guys so much for, for joining today and let's get into the show. All right. We, here we are with David. How are you doing today? Doing well. How are you? I'm very good. Very good. I can't complain. So, you know, I guess for everybody listening, why don't we just start out with, uh, give us a bit of your background, kind of how you got to the space and, and what you're doing today. Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so I've always been passionate about science, more importantly, passionate about the fundamentals so I was actually um, interested in philosophy and chemistry and physics. And then in undergrad, I was also very interested in application, creating new technologies. So for a while, I was trying to figure out how to address both of, both of those seemingly desperate fields, uh, prototyping, application, and fundamental science. And then it was through inorganic chemistry and energy storage, battery, uh, photophysics, that I could see how you could apply those to solve real challenges, mostly around energy storage and for renewable energy. And so after undergrad, mostly focused on, which in which I, I focused on molecular chemistry and energy storage, I went to do a PhD at UC Berkeley in a group that I think fantastically combines doing fundamental science, but with an eye for application. That was Jeff Long's group. Uh, and he's most known for various things, but one of those is metal organic frameworks which are basically materials that you can design, you can tune at the molecular level. So you can really choose a desirable property by tuning the atoms of the material. And it was through that that I got introduced to hydrogen storage and all the different challenges and problems, both technical challenges, market problems, and started to think more deeply about that. And what are the metrics that matter? Is it just sort of the, these DOE targets? Are there other metrics? How far away are we from meeting those? And that's when I started to think more deeply about it and teamed up with one of my uh, good friends from undergrad, uh, Ted McElveen, who's one of the founders of, of Vern. And, and one informal thing led to the next, and we took Dave Danielson's course at Stanford, it's now Stanford Climate Ventures, it's what it's called. It's an awesome program, awesome class. It's formerly a course at Stanford. And that's when we started looking at hydrogen storage, where it makes sense, where there are real market needs. And from that, we uh, teamed up with a third co-founder, Bab Roy. So the three co-founders, we incorporated, started to look at this more seriously. Kind of fast forward today, I, I finished my PhD last summer. Ted and Bab graduated from their um, MBA programs at Stanford. So now we've been doing this full time and the company is called Vern and we're focused on enabling hydrogen uh, for zero emission operations of heavy duty transportation. So think hydrogen for trucks, hydrogen for planes, hydrogen for ships. Got it. So is this focused primarily then on the the fuel itself? Could you maybe walk us through like the technology specifically when you say enabling? Like that could be a number of things. Yeah. So we 
the fundamentally we're, we're starting from you wanted to think from first principles as to what what type of hydrant makes the most sense there's liquid there's compressed there's 350 bar compressed 700 bar compressed and what we wanted to solve for was uh what what is the optimal almost sweet spot for high density and low cost and it's this it's hydrant that's known as cryo compressed so it's both cold but not all the way that it's liquid and it's not compressed in how you normally see it today at 700 bar. And you combine benefits of both. So we're really developing a, a platform technology around crowd compressed hydrogen. And so the first product, the one we, we most developed so far is on the storage side. You can effectively just think of it as tanks that go back and store the hydrogen. That's part of the equation. The other equation is getting hydrogen to be crowd compressed. So for that, you can think of a, a on-site production, electrolysis, great. After that, we take care of the rest. We convert that hydrogen into this high dense state. So it's this process that really efficiently cools and compresses. So then you have the full supply chain for crowd compressed. So you can pull up in your truck at a refueling station and the crowd compressors, we're calling it, uh, convert hydrogen to crowd compress. And that fills up the, the tank system that we've developed. Okay, so it's focused on the tank system that that is storing it, okay. so. I guess maybe there's there's a lot of things to unpack. Obviously, this is a lot, very technical topic. Maybe, um, maybe could you talk about what what specifically? You know, obviously, I understand you're focused on the the trucking right now. Could you talk about some of the issues that have faced you know making hydrogen adapted to the trucking space so far, and kind of how what you're doing now is really going to be able to to help overcome those barriers to advance the space. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's definitely very technical. We can happy to go in different directions uh, to unpack this further. And so think about it just from trucking and so where we are today and what's actually needed. Um, so technologies today, what's been done historically starting in, in 2000, those are, there was a big push for hydrogen back then. And a lot of this was just on compression. Hydrogen is great um, in terms of its gravimetric density but you really have to compress it to get at high enough biometric densities. So the, the last two decades have really focused on how do we compress hydrogen and densify it as much as possible and store that. And that's 700 bar storage, also known as type four tank storage. And those systems are, they're good. That's mostly what's been used today. So Toyota Mirai, uh, you can see them in, in California, there's probably four to 5,000 of those driving around. They use those type four tanks. And those are fine, but they're, they're very expensive. It requires a lot of carbon fiber. As you increase the pressure, you need to increase the amount of carbon fiber. So cost is an issue for trucks. Trucks really need to bring down uh, cost capital and, and operating mm -hmm. uh, in contrast to light duty vehicles. So cost is a huge issue. The other issue is just the, main, the, the amount of hydrogen you can store. So it's still not good enough for what they're used to relative to diesel operations. And so trucks today have been trying to have trialing uh, technologies, fuel cell technologies and using type four tanks, but they're still too heavy. So you can think of it as from the amount of hydrogen per weight of the system that you can store is still too low. So you, you eat up the payload that they can carry. So that's been a really big pain point. On the other hand, you also have other trucks. You can think of almost Amazon delivery where a lot of boxes on there, you open a box and then there's another box and then there's styrofoam and then it's a little iPhone cover. So those are volume limited. So it's not necessarily payload, but volume limited. So these tanks take up too much space and it's affecting how many goods they can carry. Mm -hmm. So those are the issues. Those are the pain points on the storage side uh, today for, for trucks. And now they're looking for more dense solutions, both volumetric and gravimetric. And so what would really enable the fuel cells, and electrolysis, and enable the entire hydrogen ecosystem, one of the bottlenecks right now is storage. So if we can, if we can double the densities that's gonna make it easier for truck operators to try the technology and then utilize the electrolysis, utilize the fuel cell. Um, so yeah, in, in some storage is, is still a big issue and we need better performance and better costs both. And our solution aims to offer both of those. Okay, so in terms of the, I think I, I'm getting the hang of this a little bit. This is like uh, quite deep for me, but I just wanna unpack it a little bit. So there's the storage kind of like the fuel tank. And then there's obviously the fuel cell itself that performs the energy creation, right? So is your solution focused on the energy storage or the, the storage of it? And then as well as the, the fuel cell? 
No, for onboard system, only the, you can think of it as fuel tank. Fuel tank, okay, Just got the, it. Yeah. That makes sense, okay. So that's interesting. So so essentially to try to put it in our technical terms, you're trying to take the this this fuel and create it because it can be compressed, but compressing it to a smaller amount that it's not, um, it's not creating this heavy fuel tank that is taking up space or weight, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, finding that optimum and it's not compressing it further. It's rather looking at the phase diagram of hydrogen where there's really high density mm -hmm. without going to too high pressure and without going to too cold of temperature. Okay. Got it. Okay. So then in terms of implementing this, could you, could you talk about where you guys are with your technology now, or maybe specifically the cost? I'm, I'm very curious to understand the costs um, of operating, you know, let's say, obviously let's keep focusing on, on semi trucks, for example. Um, what are the costs of operating when, we, when you're using your technologies compared to conventional? Yeah, so where we are today, we, um, we're doing our first physical prototype demonstration. Uh, so far, everything now has been uh, extensive modeling based on previous work done by some national labs. So government funded original work, proof of concept, really cool work. Um, so we're taking that, making it commercial, making it sort of larger scale and road uh, capable and other performance improvements. And so that first physical demonstration is going to happen this quarter. So you can demonstrate the, how much hydrogen you can store and, and all those things. We have a few other prototypes that we're in parallel building for other demonstrations. Uh, so the so early demonstration stage overall. And in terms of cost, um, so some of the, the pathways to cost, so to put some of the things in perspective, uh, some of the targets with current technologies today, high four tanks, you're probably, um, you're probably at around $15 per kilowatt hour. And yeah, $15 per kilowatt hour. And so that is, uh, assuming you, you increase production uh, even greater than what's being done today. For, for us, our pathway uh, is, a, is a different one. So we can get, we're targeting about $8 to $9 per kilowatt hour stored. Uh, another way to think about this is per dollar of, per dollar uh, or, or per kilogram of hydrogen stored, X amount of, of money is required to store it. And because we have, twice amount of hydrogen in the given system, we just have much higher density. On a per kilogram basis, it's a lot cheaper. So on a dollar per kilowatt hour or a dollar per kilogram, it's a lot cheaper. So um, so about yeah, $15 per kilogram for technology today at higher scale than today. Ours, assuming same production, that's not today, we're, we're making tens of these maybe, but, but, but around 5,000 a year, we should get to $8 per kilowatt mm -hmm. and at kilowatt hour. And then batteries, just as a, as a reference point, lithium ion batteries, probably around uh, $120, $140 per kilowatt hour. Okay, got it. Yeah, I think that that's, to, from my limited scientific and technical knowledge, it's become pretty obvious that it's very difficult to solve with, um, you know, the traditional batteries for these trucks. So um, I guess, you know, maybe one thing I'd be keen to understand is, is the path forward initially going to be retrofitting existing trucks? Is it going to be building new ones? I'm, I'm really curious about the, the process because I obviously understand, to me, this is one of the most fascinating problems of the climate tech solutions that we need to find is uh, the non-technical or sorry, the non-software solutions, right? The physical, the manufacturing, these things are very difficult to figure out, very expensive, capital intensive, et cetera. Could you walk us through that process or what you guys are thinking currently and how you'll kind of go through that deployment process? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's very, very time dependent. So one of the things that I think we think the best pathway right now is retrofitting new trucks. So fuel cell trucks, uh, focusing on fuel cell trucks, there's not too many. So that's almost a, a limiting factor. But for those fuel cell trucks, they're going to uh, have those type four tanks as uh, we can think of it as incumbent technology. So our, for our first demonstrations, we're thinking of we're building our system. So they have basically the same exterior spe uh, specs. So we can swap in our tanks for their tanks. So it's going to be retrofits for fuel cell trucks. And those are pretty new. And that's what we, th what, what, what we think we will be doing for the first few years. After that, there's ways where we can uh, upfront working with the OEM to further optimize the system. But I think that's not, it's not necessary. We can very much retrofit and there's thermal integration that we can do on our side. Uh, but integration overall, 
is not too complex. It's not, for example, going to influence the fuel cell or the OEM uh, the truck design. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Obviously, I think that that's like kudos to you guys for that. That's always a super difficult thing when it comes to you know, obviously the goal is to mass manufacture, you know, actual machines. So that's helpful to understand. Um, maybe, you know, just kind of stepping back a little bit, could you talk a little bit about the, I guess, the importance of solving this issue for, you know, for commercial transport, given, you know, the existing emissions that commercial transport makes up for every year? I'd just be keen to hear some data points that you have on that. Yeah. And, um, I mean, one of the reasons we're really passionate about it is because of the, the big CO2 abatement opportunity. That's sort of our, our true north. And so you can think of it as 16% of global CO2 emissions are around transportation. Six of those go to light duty vehicles. And for that, we got a good sense of how we can abate most of those. Electric vehicles are fantastic. The remaining 10%, uh, that's heavy duty. So 4% is trucks, 3% aviation, 3% shipping. There, uh, we need a little bit of everything. So batteries can play a role to some extent. You have ammonia uh, and shipping, methanol and synthetic aviation fuels. There's gonna be a big mix. And the, the general idea is the, the thesis of electrify everything, of electrification is not sufficient. So we need higher dense, uh, denser fuels and really go after this 10% of CO2 abatement opportunity. Um, and within trucking, once you go for operations that are 200 miles or more, that's when uh, it might be payload, very payload limited for using batteries. So there's a clear challenge, there's no clear solution. So that's sort of what we got excited where there's a clear need to have hydrogen. And so the impact there is helping to go after that 10% of global CO2 emissions and roughly for every truck that you convert from diesel operations to zero emissions, this is assuming green hydrogen, you're saving about 130 uh, tons per year. So, and that's just one truck, but 800,000 trucks are made per year. So there's a clear pathway to, to scaling this up and having a very meaningful impact just within trucking. Um, of course, if this succeeds in trucking and there's more pilots available, we have, our plan is to move into shipping and aviation um, and just accelerate it. Time is important, and I think we can. Uh, that's incredibly important to us, not just the end state, but how fast we get there. And so, I think part of our technology is based on getting to market as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously, you know, the, the, of course, the faster you get there, the faster you can start to see any, you know, improvements that could be carried on to the next to the next iterations. Um, what about the, I guess, the abundance of hydrogen? Right? If if there's, it sounds like there's already trucking companies that are building these these. Uh, these heavy duty trucks that have, that are fuel cell trucks, what is the availability to fuel these? Like, how does that look right now in terms of the infrastructure and what are some of the, the major challenges that will be faced to build it out? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. And it's where most of the challenges probably lie, kind of market risk, a lot of market risk. And this is, uh, yeah, an extensive infrastructure required and it's massive scale we're talking about. So today it's, Hydrogen overall uh, per year, it's, it's 90 million tons, 90 megatons per year produced, and about 20 kilotons go to transportation, so very small amount. So today, 90, 90 million tons. By, by 2050, um, so end state for zero emission society, the amount of hydrogen required for transportation is expected to be on the order of magnitude of what we produce in total. So about 90 uh, million tons just for transportation in 2050. So we're talking about uh, converting everything we're doing today for this really established industry of hydrogen just for transportation. So it's a, it's a massive, massive growth is expected, massive, massive infrastructure. Um, people are probably more aware of this on electrolysis. That's kind of on the, uh, more on the deployment side, massive scale being announced. Um, and yeah, and, and so that market's, yeah, 100x growth in, in the next two decades. So very, very much in the early innings, very early stages. So for us, it, it is an issue in that there's not too many players, whether it's from production side, having enough hydrogen, it's very expensive today. Um, two specialty vendors, all this requires specialty components, whether it's compressors to nozzles, that's limiting. There's not enough people in the game, not enough companies in the, in the, in the space. So those are all certainly challenges and a lot of risk. 
same time, it's opportunity. And I think there's companies that are moving fast to capture this, this void mm -hmm. that becomes more and more apparent every day. Um, and so, yeah, that's overall, I think, where we are today. We're in second or third inning uh, very early. And for example, today, if we want to do some demonstrations, it requires a lot of work just to identify a fuel cell truck figure out where we're going to get the hydrogen, figure out where the testing center is. There's a handful of testing centers where you could do this. And so um, that, that makes it part of the challenge of how do we maximize the limited resources to move as fast as possible. Yeah, that's going to be fascinating. I think I have a couple other questions to get to maybe pull on that thread a bit more in a second. But I'm kind of curious also about the, you know, obviously when we talk about batteries, typical batteries, a lot of people are concerned about supply chain issues. What are some of the supply chain issues that are likely to be faced in this space? If any, you know, could you walk us through that process? Yeah, well, um, the most obvious one is hydrogen production um, and getting it to the end point. But beyond hydrogen, uh, for making the tanks, let's say, on the manufacturing side of the systems, the most uh, notable one is carbon fiber. So our current designs use carbon fiber, and there is a big carbon fiber shortage. Uh, and so prices have been going up and it's just making it hard. It's slowing things down. So that is a, a big risk, uh, short carbon fiber. Beyond that, everything else, we're, we're trying to make it so it's uh, relatively easy to acquire uh, typical alloys and, and a few other components and just specialty manufacturing. But um, yeah, so carbon fiber certainly stands out. Okay, um, interesting. Yeah, I think that obviously it's, it's helpful to understand that there's essentially if I understand correctly, the process of creating this clean hydrogen that can be used is, that's abundant, right? We won't run out of that aspect. It's just the other materials, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. You know, okay, let's move on to, I think this is how we can tie this together here. Could you talk about the process of, it's my understanding that uh, one of the obvious, I think, arguably most prestigious um, climate tech venture firms, Breakthrough Energy Ventures has invested in you guys, if I understand correctly. Um, you know, could you talk about the process of, you know, how you met them, how you came to get in contact with them, what, what was it like getting funded from them? And I think from there, we can talk about partnerships and solving some of these solutions from there. Yeah. Um, so we we're part of their Niagara program. So it's not where, where we were not invested to, uh, by Breakthrough Energy Ventures, but rather it's break within the Breakthrough Energy to build this whole ecosystem to go from sort of science to scaling up and to go from sort of science and prototypes to market entry, there the new program is called Breakthrough Energy Fellows. It's part of their philanthropic arm. And that's the program that we were accepted to um, and that we're part of. And so we're incredibly grateful and excited and it's already accelerated our, our development. But the overall thought there is, um, we need a lot of shots on goal. There's a lot of great technology that no VC right now is willing to invest in. There's a lot of risks, but within about a one or two year time frame and, and some money, you can de-risk those and make a go-no-go -go decision, whether you can follow VC trajectory on funding and scale. That's kind of the premise of Breakthrough Energy Fellows. And that's where we, uh, and so we fall under that sort of category. We need to de-risk a few of these concepts. And so we are, we in, in terms of partnering, partnering with them and how that whole process went, they're very interested in what are the technical milestones that if you, first of all, what are the technical milestones that you can do in two years? And if you succeed, are you confident that you can then go on this VC trajectory and get to scale fast? Um, they don't care so much about necessarily going on a VC trajectory, but they, kill, they care a lot about getting a technology to the market. Mm -hmm. And so for us and in interacting with them in the, in the early days was trying to figure out, um, is, it, is this doable in two years? Like what do we really need to do? If we do this, is it really true that we can then kind of get funding from private capital and start to scale up? Um, and yeah, so we, we believe so uh, with about a year and a half of some de-risking. But the, the pathway that led to us being part of this inaugural program was through, uh, I think, many, many things. There's a few channel recommendations, I believe, through, uh, we were lucky to have participated in one that MIT uh, Clean Energy Prize last year, which is very fun. Uh, but before that was, when I mentioned top of the of our interview, we signed up for do this class at Stanford called Stanford. Back then it's called Stanford Energy Ventures. And I think that's the type of class that we just need to 100x in, in, in the world in the U.S. to help get technologies out to market. 
So when we did that, that's when we thought about, you know, different technologies. Let's focus with this product market fit. And throughout the course, you get guidance from people like Dave Danielson of Breakthrough Energy Ventures. And so it was sort of building that relationship and getting a sense of what's required. And, and then he sort of suggested that this could be a great program. And sort of one thing led to the next and we applied and, and all that. So, um, but overall, I think it, was, it all starts with that class, that type of environment where you're able to create a team, do product market fit, get some guidance. And so far, so the program formally started in, in September. It's been great. They've had some great speakers. Uh, Bill Gates spoke, John Doerr, uh, a few others, and providing guidance along the way and making sure we're doing our, our technical milestones and, and um, doing what we need to do within the time frame allowed so we can get to the market fast. Okay, interesting. So that, that's very fascinating. To me, this, this whole... A lot of people, uh, a lot of people ask me, "Oh, wh why, why shouldn't we just let? If the technology is better, why shouldn't we just let the natural market tendencies kind of make their way to to fix climate change?" And I'm always, you know, obviously, we, you and I both know that as we're talking about right now, the infrastructure problems. Like, there's so many things that need to be essentially quarterbacked. So I'm very fascinated by what what Bev is doing with this. It sounds like they're really trying to tie all the pieces together as much as they can. Obviously, it's a great market opportunity for them too, but. I'm curious, have you guys had specific interaction with maybe other people in their program that are in adjacent fields that would have to be, and as we talked about, there's other pieces to the puzzle. Have you been involved with them trying to like make sure that uh, things are on the same page? I, I think that integration at some point in the future would be important for some of these things. I'm just kind of curious if that's been uh, a part of the part of the process. Yeah, you mean in, in how they think about how they could um, orchestrate partnerships between different exactly. uh, companies. Yeah, there, there's been some of that. I think now, at least for Breakthrough Energy Fellows, it's fairly early stage companies. And so there's uh, there's some companies that are doing electrolysis. And so there's clearly ways where we could partner with them because we really enable on-site production to become high density hydrogen. So we started early, early conversations and more kind of building what would be possible and, and how we could work together, but not in enough detail because I think right now it's still very early. Um, but they certainly encourage that. And so we, it's very much, the, the cohort is quite close. We're meetings together quite frequently. So it's uh, encouraged, it's informal. And part of that makes sense because it's so bit early for us to, to, I think there's too much risk if we were to do a combined demonstration, for example. Uh, but maybe at the end of the program, that could be a goal. Yeah, I think this is just fascinating. This whole idea of solving these solutions maybe the best way we could go next next topic here there's a there's a number of things that they all kind of bounce into each other which is what i found interesting with this space but maybe i'd like to hear your thoughts on the regulatory side of things right as these technologies kind of get proven and some probably start to take off more than others you know we obviously looked at the issue of integration and at some point to in order to make it so that there's a widespread integration is there going to be you think an independent body that's going to say hey you know this is the standard right now um or do you think the government will step in and maybe could you talk about also i know this is a lot of things but it's just going to all be on the thread about the the risks of implementing a standard when there's possibly better technology to be developed that might fall outside of that standard yeah yeah, there's a lot there. So I think in general, another way to accelerate new technologies is if it were more accessible for startups to get clarity on certification pathways and sort of navigating the different agencies is, is very difficult. Um, but to answer your question, so there, there's various routes this could all look and there's definitely governing bodies already, usually for at least for hydrogen, it's very well established um, what kind of the codes you want to follow and so on. Um, there's just a lot of different bodies. So you typically have to consider a few, but one of the more notable ones is, is uh, GTR, GTR code. Um, so GTR, Global Technology Regulations. Um, GTR, and then GTR 13 discusses hydrogen and sort of what's required in the standards. And so there's definitely clarity, there's definitely a pathway, but it's very different on US versus Europe, for example. And so, um, and versus, yeah, country by country, it's very different. So overall, it's very difficult. But for a new technology, there's usually at least some precedents they can kind of base it off. So we're, we're basing things off GTR 13. Um, but at the same time, uh, our technology is, since it's, it's a new way to do things, uh, distinct enough where it doesn't necessarily 
it's not black or white, it checks the box. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have to work with uh, OEMs and do some sort of um, self-certification, working with them and get their buy-in. So the, that is a process that I think could be streamlined if, if a new body were, were established or other ways to kind of guide startups in this, but it's really a big challenge. Um, and it's not necessarily a question of will it get done, it's just when and how much money it will require. And yeah, and so the, I think typically by figuring out what, what are the incumbent technologies, what certifications are they based on, can we learn anything from that? And then once you do that, then I think also working with OEMs can help. So that's kind of what we're doing. Europe, I think working with OEMs is less, potentially less helpful. I think there's more sort of standard codes that everyone has to abide by. So it's a bit more strict. Um, but yeah, that's a general pathway. And so we're gonna have, we're gonna have to figure out very different strategies, US versus Europe and, mm -hmm. and other countries. What what is your thought then on the on that last part about, you know, when when these standards get in place and you know, maybe a, a large um, a large number of separate OEMs, you know, independently operating decide to go down a certain route and then a new technology comes along. Like, do you like do you have any concerns about how regulatory affairs tend to affect these like you look at our country for example is focused around uh, individual car ownership right because that's kind of what the government pushed uh, at the time right whether that's a good or bad thing we don't know could have been different but i'm just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on maybe the things to consider at least when government bodies are making these determinations yeah and so at, at least they're they're well aware of that and i think the way the the regulations are written the standards they try to be somewhat agnostic to what the technology could be and think more on sort of the, the metric. And so it's sort of like, if you have a failure mode, the hydrogen that's vented has to be this flow rate. And so for more or less, they, they are made in that way, um, somewhat agnostic, but there's still gonna be places for us, for example, where it's not clear. And so, yeah, I think it is a challenge. Um, the thing they, they could do is these things are, from my understanding, not updated that regularly, maybe every, every four years or so uh, they're updated. So I think the if there was at least a more established way to engage or some way where there can be kind of shorter feedback loops, um, but of course it's gonna be very expensive. And so I, it's tough, it's definitely tough, it, it, but I think it's a challenge overall. I think the, the thing that could help is, yeah, maybe if there are shorter feedback loops and you don't have to wait four years to change the code so you can bring in on a new technology. Yeah, I think I think this is whole, this is super fascinating, right? Just like the pace of innovation, and obviously the only reason this is, seems to be a problem right now is because we're trying to look at this from a global perspective of you know climate change facing the entire the entire world. Um, that's the only reason we're thinking about this, right? If it wasn't for that, we would just say you know anathema to everything else. We're going to focus on our, on our own things, and it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, okay, let's see how, how should we go from here. Um, I guess I'm just kind of curious. Um, maybe it's kind of still on the regulatory side of things. Ian, do you think that there's, you know, we look at, uh, for example, I think it was relatively recently that California put a date on no more sale of, of uh, internal combustion vehicles. You know, when do you think, or how soon do you think that we might be at a point where that would be possible to start seeing these bans come through uh, for, you know, traditional uh, trucking, for example? Yeah, so we don't, um... We don't make assumptions or, or haven't thought enough about when bans may occur. We're almost working on the assumption that they may never occur. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it, 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 California is different than, than most of the yeah. US and most of the world. But um, yeah, so we're not working on, on that assumption. And so the, the way we're thinking about it and how we're, what we're seeing is already today, there is so much uh, pressure from not the government, from customers, from whether it's Amazon, people demanding Amazon have a lower carbon footprint or, or Walmart, et cetera. Uh, this is very relevant in Maersk and, and shipping that there's enough pressure that's already happening today, that there's a, a, just a market need for them to have zero emissions, just the marketing aspect of it. So uh, I don't really know when they would become sort of when internal combustion engines will become illegal, if they will, uh, it doesn't really affect our business model. But the more important part for us is when we can get kind of cost parity Mm -hmm. from let's say a TL perspective or dollar, yeah, dollar per model perspective for operations. And for that, we, um, so we're not assuming they're gonna be illegal in that case. And instead, we're really banking on the increased production of hydrogen and that really drive down the cost. So that, that I think is, is one of the more outsized impacts. 
as opposed mm -hmm. to our storage systems or fuel cells, just the cost of production of hydrogen and bringing that down. And so today, if you go to the, the pump, there's one, there's a hydrogen station nearby here in, in SF. Developed, I think last time I checked was $16 a, a kilogram of hydrogen. Um, so that's pretty expensive. So to reach cost parity uh, and, and in, in a way kind of answer your question, for us, we're thinking it's going to already happen late this decade um, where you don't have to assume any particular carbon tax or anything just because the hydrogen is going to go down, efficiencies are higher for these electric uh, powertrains. And so that's what we care about and that's what we're um, assuming. Mm -hmm. well, one thing I'm curious, um, I, I was meant to ask this, ask this earlier. I know, for example, with Tesla's, the, the maintenance costs are significantly lower. Is there a similar situation with these trucks as well? Yeah, yeah. And so the, the technologies are quite similar. Powertrain, electronic powertrain, everything is more or less the same. It's just the, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a fuel cell, but it's all electronic. So you have uh, almost all the similar advantages as you would in just a purely battery operated truck. So because of that, um, I think it, part of it is yes, less maintenance costs for sure. But a lot of that too is we don't fully know. Um, this is all pretty new. There's a lot of data on buses. So fuel cell buses have been operating for a long time and all that data is just, yeah, yeah, a lot less operating cost. Um, but it's still the early days of the fuel cells and so the early days of a fuel cell powering a class eight truck, 500 miles. Um, but overall, yeah, it suggests similar benefits as you're hearing about battery electric trucks. Mm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I think that'll be that'll be fascinating to see because I know I think I think about my parents and you know the amount of money they spend on maintenance for driving their vehicles. You know, they don't typically take long trips, but you know, if they had a Tesla, for example, it might be a different story, right? Um, I think that'll be interesting to see those things play out on a, on a large scale. You know, this, this question might be, if you don't want to take a swing at this one, feel free to let me know, but I'm just kind of curious. I, this is something I've been thinking about as this podcast has rolled on is the idea of with, with intellectual property, given that this is a big, the challenge we're facing climate change, you know, what are your thoughts in general on why companies are still, I, I understand like there's capitalism, of course, but why companies are really, really holding on to patenting their technology, even though, you know, if they start and grow, even if they grow at a very rapid pace, the, the ability to get across the globe with just their technology is going to be much slower than if they did, say, for example, for example, what Tesla did, right, and help, like, make it available to other people, to other uh, players to get into the space. What are your thoughts generally on this, if you want to comment? Yeah, well, I... I uh... Yeah, I'll just comment here without having thought too much about it. I think it's a really interesting question and kind of gets at the heart of what I'm also really excited about, how to accelerate innovation. And for that, given that, I guess, I haven't thought enough about it, but I think, um, so whatever I say is probably not that informative. <laughs> I think my first, my first reaction to that is, um, I, yeah, I'd like to look more on the, on the data and, and understand a bit more. But I think part of that just has to do with having direct skin in the game. And I guess that's what sort of really capitalism is all about. So if I'm just thinking from our perspective, if we had, if it's RIP, we have more skin in the game, more motivation to put in the long hours. And it's sort of, we have ownership of, of the revenues. We have ownership of the impact. I think if you dilute that, um, and it's not black or white, the, the answer, but I think if you dilute that, you have less of that effect, less of that drive. But maybe you can, you can compensate for that by just having many more entities just working as opposed to one startup working, as kind of you alluded to. Um, yeah, so, so I don't know, is that something you, you think a lot about? I'd be curious to, to know what, what you think or if you have any resources on this. That's as It's a very new idea to me that I'm just like starting to recognize that it, you know, if we're really trying to solve these issues, I feel like there should be some kind of happy medium made where you, know, you can, maybe it's you make a partnership where you, you can sell your, your IP for a reasonable price, obviously you still want to make a profit. Whoever invented that should be rewarded. I believe, I believe in that. But I think that you know, if you could start to get this deployed in other places in the world, maybe you go to another market and you you know make an agreement. Hey, you get this technology, but you guys stay out of our playground for a while. Like I just think that there could be something there to help accelerate the general adoption of these new technologies, while not bottlenecking it to one company's success or failure. You know. Yeah. No, and I think the last thing I'll say on that, I think. The licensing our technology, that's something that 
uh, maybe we'll think about down the road, but we really want to, you know, build, build the full foundation and, and take it to market. But that's something we can think more heavily on. And part of Breakthrough Energy Fellows mission is more on uh, getting into the market. So they care less about you know, one company doing this. They just, so yeah, I think licensing model and, and thinking beyond the traditional sort of venture capital capitalistic model, something, not that it's not capitalistic to license it, but I think that's something I just need to be more informed on. And yeah, interesting mm-hmm. question. Yeah, I'll have to keep I'll have to keep that one going in the pod. Maybe maybe some other people yeah. have other, other ideas. Um, okay, just a couple of things to kind of start wrapping things up here. What are your general takes on the education system? I think you talked about this a little bit before, but how can the universities, et cetera, help to get more people in these spaces? Obviously, I'm assuming there's a good number of people who are going into universities aren't really aware of these things, but if they had the focus of like, hey, like there's this climate technology that's out there that's being developed, I want to focus my studies kind of around that. You know, I'm curious to understand the flow of people coming into this space for all of these new technologies because you know institutional uh, education is really going to be focused on what's existing, trying to keep ahead of the curve. But by nature of what they do, they're going to be slightly behind. So I'm just kind of curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, I can answer it from let's see. Uh kind of a PhD's perspective, finishing up grad school. I think most people, even at UC Berkeley, are, are hesitant to kind of join a startup or don't really understand how it's real, uh, a pathway. And even, I think there's still too much of an emphasis on doing a postdoc and being in academia and staying in academia. I think what, there's already a really, a few examples of fantastic models that I think we just need to get yeah, 10x. And so Cyclotron Road, Elon Gurr, and what he's done there is really exciting. So that's something where uh, I think it's being scaled up. So now it's activated and they have it in, uh, throughout the US and, and New York. Um, so programs like that, I think, can make a huge difference. And we're still not even close to having the impact we could have just because I, I just from friends that I have and others in, in grad school just don't think that's a possibility, aren't sure that they're gonna be able to make money after living on a grad student stipend for five years, it's pretty tough. So I think programs like that are incredibly helpful. And programs like ARPA-E, where the, the proposals and the projects are guided by what industry is looking for, what the, what the industry thinks is innovation. And I think we just need more programs like ARPA-E or just um, more ARPA-E fellows to helping move that money around and uh, making sure that we're getting High, high output and high leverage from the projects that are chosen. So I think there's there's probably a handful of, pro- of programs or institutions like Psychotron Road, ARPA-E that we just need to double down on. And I think we're so very long, we're very far away from fully having a more efficient system to get sort of people that just finished their PhDs to go do cutting in a, uh, cutting edge innovative work at a startup or creating products and working at an industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I obviously have no no real taste for what that's like, but I can imagine kind of the being being immersed in it, right? You're going to typically follow the paths that most most people follow. So it'll be important to start to get that to to break it up from the traditional methods and then to make it more normal to do things, you know, do different paths. So I think I think that's interesting. Um, maybe. I guess in, in the big picture, like in a perfect world, what do you see kind of, how, how do you see this technology, just hydro, hydrogen fuel and fuel cell technology in general, you know, how do you see it playing out and changing the world over the next 10 to 20 years in the kind of the ideal scenario? Maybe there's some things that you've thought about that, you know, aren't really common, common ideas behind hydrogen. I'm just kind of curious to hear your outlook for the future here. Yeah, well, in, in our technology specifically, part of the outlook, um, as we were just saying on top of the call, the trans- hydrogen for transportation is going to be dramatic. It's going to dramatically increase, and so uh, to the point where the scale today that's used for everything for ammonia and oil refinery would be strictly used for transportation. So, in twenty years, about ninety million tons will be used for transportation. So, out- outlook overall, dramatic growth. But I think um, double clicking on that, I think what we're, we're excited about in our outlook is having, having less of an activation barrier to try hydrogen. And so what that means is rather than having to put down $200 million to have a 20 ton per day liquefaction plant 
that's massive and requires four to five years. Instead, you can do small scale electrolysis, small scale R system. You can get it, it effectively functions like a liquefaction plant because you're getting you're getting to a density of hydrogen that's just like liquid, but you can do it at small scale. So modular systems, decentralized systems, where you're a, a big heavy duty depot and you have a hundred trucks, you just want to try two trucks, we can make that happen, one containerized system. And so having this modular growth is really going to accelerate the transition um, and match one-to-one -one demand with, with supply. And so that, I think, have, following that progress, following that um, relationship of demand and supply is going to be, I think, really important and what we're really excited about. So making it yeah, modular and scalable, decentralized hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. And then I guess maybe the final question I'd be keen to understand, especially given your background, what would you say is your, your best advice for entrepreneurs in this space looking to, to make a difference, whether that be technical people, people who've gone down the, you know, the very engineering background or the commercial side? Like what, what is your recommendation for people as they're, let's say they're entering university or coming out of university? Yeah, well, if these are if these are folks looking for jobs, I think even if it's a highly technical startup that's focused on R and D like ours is, we we still need so many just competent, passionate people. We don't necessarily need all hardcore engineers. And so I think whoever whoever is excited and, and is passionate and competent should have the self confidence to inquire at startups like like Vern or are those startups that are doing very hard things because we just need a lot of smart people on this. So that, that'd be one, I think just having more self-confidence. We just, we just need a lot of smart, competent people and you don't necessarily need to have that specific academic background or specific industry experience to transition to that startup you're really excited about. Very good. I think that's, that's, um, that's great to hear. I think I, I would agree with that sentiment a lot. So Awesome. I really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, this has been this has been great. Uh, we'll have to have you on again as the technology continues to evolve and you guys continue to make your milestones. So very excited for this and, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, that sounds great. And uh, and so we can find this on vernh2.com. We're actively hiring. Uh, so you can reach out to us, um, operations, engineers, kind of everything. Um, we'll, we'll be growing a lot this year. So please feel free to find us there, reach out. And yeah, thanks a lot for, for guiding this, this conversation. I think there's a lot of fun follow-ups we could have. Looking forward to, to keeping in touch. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited for what you guys do. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining on today's episode with David. Really hope you enjoyed the conversation. Hope it helped you learn a bit more about the space. I think, uh, you know, having this, this double episode week, especially on this kind of one topic, I hope it provides a lot of learning for a lot of people. Again, that's the whole reason we've started this podcast. So I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you are joining us for the first time, again, please, as usual, um, subscribe and put on notifications so you can be made, made aware of more episodes in the future. And then, of course, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, we always appreciate our review. It goes a long way. It really does. Uh, some people kind of underestimate that, but it's really, really powerful for us to help get the reach of this show up and to help kind of raise more awareness for uh, the climate tech space. So please do that if that's where you listen. And of course, as always, share the episode with somebody you might, you think that might find this interesting, maybe somebody who you've gotten to an argument with about these things in the past. Again, it's always great to hear from the technical people themselves to understand how these technologies work. And if you're interested to get more involved, feel free to join the Slack channel. Link is in the description. Uh, so you can be part of in part of a community of other climate tech professionals and kind of amateurs people learning uh, just a really interesting place for people to interact and then of course you can always subscribe to the newsletter which comes out the 27th of every month connect with david on linkedin and reach out to them maybe if you want to learn more directly and then of course as always feel free to hit me up on twitter with any questions you might have i'm um, a quick teaser so next week we will be hearing from brendan banfield at Gridsite, which is an australian company uh, that essentially helps utilities utilize and, and manage uh, distributed energy resources better than they have been, right? There's a lot of data that typically is, is either collected or, or not collected, um, and they're able to take that and basically help uh, understand, kind of like a, essentially making, a, making, making microgrids out of, the, out of the 
the broader grid to some extent, right? He'll explain it better in the podcast next week. But again, really interesting conversation coming up next week with Brendan. So really hope you guys tune in for that. But until then, we will see you next time on Clean Tech is the Podcast. Mm-hmm.